Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. This is our first book talk of the semester. Uh, my name is Nicholas Mignanelli, and I'm the head of programming at the Lillian Goldman Law Library. And the subject of this afternoon's book talk is The Prophet of Harvard Law, James Bradley Thayer and His Legal Legacy. Uh, we're pleased to have two of the authors here with us today, Jake Mazetis and Dr. Andrew Porwinsher. Professor Samuel Moyne and David N. Schleicher will be facilitating and recording this session for their podcast, Digging a Hole. Jake Mazetis is a third year student at Yale Law School. Following graduation, he will clerk at the Colorado Supreme Court and then the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, Dr. Andrew Porinsher is the Wick Carey Professor of Constitutional Studies at the University of Oklahoma. He's the author of several books on American history, including The Jewish World of Alexander Hamilton, and is currently working on his fifth book, Theodore Roosevelt and the Jews. Professor Samuel Moyne is Chancellor and Kent Professor of Law and History at Yale University. And David N. Schleicher is a professor of law at Yale Law School. Thank you all so much for being here today. All right. All right, all, no. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right. Terrific. So uh, welcome to the joint uh, library book talk and episode of Digging a Hole, the Legal Theory Podcast. And so we're so happy to have you with us and so happy to be here with you. Um, so I want to start off with a basic question. Who was James Bradley Thayer, and what was his legal legacy? <laughs> Go for it. First off, let me just say thank you so much to Yale Law School, to the law library, to the faculty here, and to Jake for helping pull this event off, and to all of you for being here. It's really exciting to be able to share the story of James Bradley Thayer. He's a name that is largely forgotten today, but we believe that he's one of the most important figures in American legal history and had a deeper imprint on American law than the vast majority of sitting judges. He was a professor at Harvard Law School in the latter quarter of the 19th century. And some of the figures who would become iconic names in the pantheon of the federal bench, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Louis Brandeis, Learned Hand, were mentees of Thayer. They learned American law at his feet. They internalized his jurisprudence. And later in life, when they reached their privileged perches on the bench and in the legal academy, they promoted the philosophy of law that they had first learned from James Bradley Thayer. So Andrew and Jake, uh, it's an amazing book. Congrats on doing it. I'm very grateful because I'm a Thayer stan. Uh, I, I do have some difficulties with uh, whether he nails the landing in introducing his constitutional theory, but we'll get into that. Uh, so a couple of questions just about him before we turn to his students. Um, w one is kind of uh, about you know how you ended up writing this book in the way you did, um, because it's, it's kind of recursive. It's a book by a teacher and his students about a teacher and his students. Um, and so w why? I mean, what is, is there something to that or is it just an accident? Um, and why focus in general on the relation of teachers and students since, you know, my experience is that students, you know, don't listen or claim to and <laughs> they go their own way. You know, they might even come up with their own ideas and attribute to them to you after you're dead. It hasn't happened to me yet, but... Um, <laughs> I just think students end up being pretty subversive at times in relation to pedagogical authority. So just give us a sense of why you two ended up working together and what, why place the, the, the student-teacher relationship at the center. So I'll say a bit, which is that I think I first took Andrew's class my second year, my sophomore year at OU, and he teaches in the Constitutional Studies program, which is something that I was obviously interested in now that I'm a law student, uh, and I, I, I wrote a paper for you that I, you, you quite liked, and it was the first time that someone had given positive feedback on something, and then I think a, a kind of, you know, wonderful mentor-mentee relationship and now, now a really wonderful friendship kind of blossomed from that, and I think that the decision, I, I won't speak for Andrew, but my guess from from having talked to him is that his decision to invite students to write this book is both both inspired by his interest in Thayer and in the relationship um, of Thayer to his students, but also from his belief that students at, at a public university like Oklahoma could, could actually do the scholarly work, which I think speaks to 
not only Andrew's belief in his own students, but also something very Thayerian, which is a belief in investing in others, which was very central kind of throughout the book to, to Thayer's investment in people. Uh, I don't know if that, that gets to the heart of the question, but I think that's sort of why, I, my guess is that Andrew invited us to join this project and I'm very grateful he did. Sure, I'll just add an addendum to that. The relationship between authorship and subject matter, a book by a professor and his former students about a professor and his former students is not a coincidence. I had been waiting for somebody to write a book about James Bradley Thayer ever since I was in graduate school, and I realized that I might be waiting the rest of my career if I didn't launch the project myself. And precisely because the book would be about the important if understudied role of mentorship in legal history, because it would be about these networks of intellectual patronage between a professor and his students, it struck me as a particularly right project to co-author with students. Too often, I think, in academia, we assume that people can produce publishable work based on their seniority and not based on their ability. And what I had seen at the University of Oklahoma among our very best students like Jake was an undoubted ability to produce scholarly work that could make a significant contribution to the field. And the fact that we've not seen students coming out of undergrad from places like University of Oklahoma or many other universities doing that was not a testament to the lack of ability. It was a testament to the lack of opportunity. And so I saw this book as an experiment, and I wanted to show the field that bright students could actually do the work that is normally the preserve of the professoriate. And I leave it to readers to judge the success of the project, but I'm hugely proud to have my name share a book cover with Jake's and two, two other students of mine who are also good friends of Jake's. I personally am looking forward to a future where I can publish purely on the basis of seniority. <laughs> All right, so a couple of questions for me about kind of who Thayer was, what he stood for. Um, I think it's worth mentioning uh, that he was first and foremost an evidence law teacher uh, and scholar, and he moved into constitutional law. And just for the sake of those who haven't had his writings inflicted on them by me, uh, since some have in this uh, room. He, he, he first comes out with a, a piece in the Nation magazine in 1884, which calls for something called the clear error rule or the rule of clear mistake, that uh, the federal judiciary should only overturn federal legislation when it's clearly irrational. Uh, and then he uh, pretends in uh, an article about a decade later in the Harvard Law Review, probably, according to some, the most important constitutional law piece ever written, that this clear error rule was had long been part of American law. So you present Thayer as a, a, the kind of font of legal realism. That's the kind of main thesis of the book. I wondered if it would have been better to see him as a Democrat what he seemed to believe, at least looking at his work on juries uh, in evidence law scholarship and then in these con law pieces is that the people should rule themselves, not judges. And it's not that they can't make mistakes, but the people should be allowed to learn from their mistakes when they pass bad laws. Uh, and so why, why call him a realist, which could mean so many things. Why not say he's fundamentally a Democrat and wants to keep constitutional law from uh, taking over the de democracy we were, had barely built and still have? So I, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, and there are certainly Democratic themes running throughout his theory of kind of legislative deference and the clear error rule. I would say that I think part of our decision to invoke legal realism partly is to fit into kind of the larger discussion. We view the folks that he mentored as legal realists, and so it makes sense to identify him in the legal realist tradition. Uh, and I think that there's something important about pointing out that 
judges might be motivated by factors other than kind of root formalism in determining the outcome of judicial decisions. And in fact, that might be important for recognizing why democracy is particularly important, right? If there's not some legal truth or there isn't some kind of formalistic structure that has a scientific basis and that we can rely on for kind of the provision of, of law that we might see as good, then it's important to identify how judges are operating, perhaps in order to to kind of get to the democratic position. So I wouldn't say that we're necessarily saying he's not. I think it's a it's a point well taken. But I also think that the definition as legal realist is important to kind of access the rest of his his ideology. Sure. I I would suggest that to Jake's point, Thayer is a Democrat and he's a legal realist. These two elements are mutually reinforcing. He believes in judicial deference to legislatures, and that conviction is of a piece with a broader philosophy of law that we describe as realism in which he rejects axiomatic thinking. He rejects the formalist model of law wherein judges discover universal principles and apply them with dispassion to achieve rectitude of decision. He rejects the idea that law exists in the ether. He stresses that law is man-made, and he emphasizes to his students in his classroom, and he emphasizes in his writings, that law is riddled with idiosyncrasy, with indeterminacy, with contradiction. And so I would suggest that realism is not a term that we're imposing on him. We are finding the characteristics that legal historians generally recognize as realists are pervasive throughout his writings, and indeed they are elements that his various disciples are internalizing and applying in their own work on the bench and in the academy. So the thing that struck me most about the kind of broad, broad kind of presentation of Thayer's famous constitutional ideas is while on one hand he's the kind of uh, skeptic of axiomatic thinking as you just described, he's an utter naif about judges. So the judges in his world are supposed to read an article in the Harvard Law Review or in The Nation and say, aha, I should kind of make my life a lot more boring by saying that I'm only going to invalidate laws when um, it's so obvious that they probably wouldn't have passed them in the first place. Um, I'm going to abjure power. I mean, obviously, this is, uh, there's a long literature on whether, you know, power ambition checks ambition or whatever, but th this was required a real, um, either like a, kind of a naivete about what might drive judicial decision making actually, other than the best argument. And so, we, wh why? He knew judges, he knew that they were humans who have all the failings of humans and also have all of the desire to have their in government and they have the desire to have their ideological ambitions achieved one way or another. And there are some who are self-denying in certain ways or that was their ideology, but others like, it wasn't like he was, so what explains this like willingness to believe that judges are just gonna like listen and not <laughs> decide things with the, how they want? I would say that Thayer perhaps was naive in this regard, and we were talking about this over breakfast. I'm a historian. I don't have a JD. I never went to law school, and so I don't have to defend the thought of the people that I write about, and I feel very free to suggest that Thayer probably was short-sighted uh, to the degree that judges would be self-constraining. Now, there were judges who did read his work and were inspired to exercise self-restraint, but those were often people who had been former students of his. Most judges did not pass through Thayer's classroom at Harvard Law in the late 19th century. So what do you do about the vast majority of judges who were not informed by Thayer in their most formative years? And Professor Moyne has offered some suggestions for actions that legislatures could take, that Congress could take, to rein in judges by something other than just some ennobled ideal of judicial restraint. He's suggested, and he could, he could speak to this more than I could, uh, you know, we could pass legislation that strips the judiciary of some of its jurisdiction. We could relo relocate some questions to be adjudicated within a quasi tribunal institution within the executive branch. And so I think that Thayer's ideas 
offer a beginning and it's up to us as successive generations to try to refine those ideas in ways that are actually work workable on the ground. Throw one thing back there, because you do recount these letters back and forth with his students where he sees them kind of falling out of his influence. And where he's like, he's like Holmes, you really did well on this one, but uh, God, have you thought about that one? Yeesh. You know, um, and so I question is like, they, they, but this doesn't ever cause him to reflect on the question I just asked you, which is to say like, like it's just it's all like a series of personal failings. It's like it's like oh, Holmes was pretty good, but then you know he didn't keep the true religion. And so like, like, did you get any sense from being deep in the materials that he ever thought about the judiciary systematically as people in that way? Well, Jake was the uh, expert on the Holmes Thayer <laughs> relationship, so I'm going to pass the mic. Yeah, I mean, this is this is my favorite part of, of the work that we did is just the very human drama of uh, for for folks who read the book. They're they're going back and forth. Um, at one point, Holmes kind of writes and like it, Holmes slights Thayer in this very public way, and uh, Thayer is writing in his diary about how how upset he is. So. Uh, to, to Professor Schleicher, Schleicher's point, there's a, there's a lot of kind of reflection on other people's personal failings. Uh, I, I didn't get the sense, kind of going through the material that I went through, that Thayer is thinking about the judiciary writ large, but I also think that, much like most theorists, right, he's explaining what his theory of the good is, what his theory of judicial good is. And I, I agree that I don't necessarily think that he's connecting the dots of from where we are to where to where we could be, uh, but I do think that the introduction of his theories into legal opinions by his, by his kind of protégés, opinions that become the basis for a lot of other theory indicates that he was successful in some regard, at least in kind of getting his, his opinions and theories out there, um, whether or not judges can be constrained by their own uh, intellectual kind of pursuits and, and realizations about law, I think, is a, a reasonable criticism. So I want to come back to that, but I, I do want to ask a kind of safe historical question first, which is, why did Thayer get so upset about this particular issue? Since a lot of realists cared about a lot of other things, um, in, most especially private law doctrine, I mean, that's really the center of the realist movement. Thayer is different. Uh, he uh, is interested in the relation between the, the newly enfranchised demos after the Civil War and kind of ass assertive judicial power. And I just, I'm just curious if you all have thoughts about what, what motivated him, what events upset him, uh, such that he would introduce the rule of clear mistake. Um, I have some hypotheses, uh, but they're not based on as much study as, as you've done. Um, one is that you know he comes from abolitionist traditions, and in the 1884 article, he's very upset about the civil rights cases, uh, which had come down uh, in 1883. Uh, and then he also is, I think, influenced by uh, his English connections and just the model in the mother country of parliamentary supremacy in which judges aren't allowed to overturn legislation. Actually, he took a trip to England in 1883, and the civil rights ca cases came down just on his return and he immediately writes the nation piece. So that, that's like, I mean, without studying it, what seems to be like the catalyst, but w there are other, are other factors in the mix, and it, give me your sense of like wh wh where, wh why he became so associated with this idea. That's a great question. As a historian, I am a fan of multi-causal explanations, and so, I think that your points are well taken, and I think they do go no small way towards explaining Thayer's interests and this democratic ethos that we see from him. I would add to that a biographical perspective dating back to his origins. Thayer is not the son of Boston Blue Buds. He is not born on Beacon Hill. He grows up into economically precarious circumstances in rural Massachusetts. And there is not much in his early life that would suggest that he was bound for the rarefied heights of an endowed chair 
at Harvard Law. I believe that it is the modesty of Thayer's upbringing that explains his sympathy for a more small d democratic vision of American law that makes him skeptical of entrusting too much power in the hands of an entrenched elite judiciary. And that instinct that originates in his family upbringing becomes refined by the very developments that Professor Moyne mentioned. I mean, but seriously, they'll let anyone have a chair at Harvard Law School. I mean, anyone. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, you know, more than that, I mean, those of us who come from nothing and end up in that situation, you know, uh, he marries a blue blood. He hangs out with her cousin or uncle, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He likes being part of, you know, elite Boston legal practice and hanging out with the great and the good. He's hired by one of the great railroad magnets of the time, Henry Villard, to write the Dakota's Constitution. So, I mean, it would be real, I, I like that hypothesis, but there's a lot of countervailing evidence that once you're in these elite spaces, you kind of, you know, adapt to the beliefs and norms of them as we see at Yale and so many other places. So if he didn't, we, we, it'd be really interesting to know why. So. My question really follows up on, on David's about what, whether there's a historical reason he, let's say, messed up. Like he perceives that judicial power is a problem, for sure. That's clear now uh, in, in American life, clearer to some people. Yes, but, everyone agrees with you, Sam. But, the world has come to this opinion, yes. But what did he do in response? Well, it seems like he took an evidence law idea. He said, okay, when can judges overturn jury fact, findings of fact? And he said, I'm going to apply that to when judges can overturn legislative determinations. And I mean, that's just a very weird analogy to begin with. But it also then fails for the reason David mentions, that it's like a self-restraint regime, not in the like petty matter of when juries get overturned on factual matters, but on the highest political questions of the Republic where judges are, are going to have political views, which they'll you know, enact. So thoughts on whether we blame him for kind of relying on the crutch of his evidence law background to try to save constitutional law. Do you want to speak to this question about presumptions, which you, <laughs> you you wrote about it at some length in the book. Yeah, um, I, I, this, it, was, it was wild before becoming a law student reading about presumptions and these different legal theories and, and having no idea what, what I was kind of going through. I'll say on, on this point, I wonder if we're, we're drilling and, and expecting a little too much of, of Thayer to say that in addition to proposing this theory of what judges should do, we also expect him to kind of make the leap between how the world is and how it, how it should be. I think that it's a fair criticism, but I'm not convinced that his theory fails because he doesn't offer a kind of proscriptive approach to how we can make the world that he's envisioning. Uh, and, and I think, Professor Moyne, like that, that's something that you, you in the intellectual tradition of Thayer have, have kind of suggested how to bring some of these ideas into the mainstream. And so I don't have necessarily a theory on, on why I, I think that the turn to evidence law, my guess would be to in some way substantiate the theory, to say that there's this existing standard in law that people are familiar with that we understand, and couldn't we read it into this other aspect of law that I have similar concerns about, and it seems that we can draw this analogy. I don't have some grand theory of why he's drawing this particular analogy other than to say, you know, law at this time is, is full of assumptions and presumptions, and maybe this one works here just as well as it works in evidence. Uh, but I also don't think that his failure to connect the dots there necessarily points to um, his failure as a theorist. I think it just means that we should be encouraged, or for folks that, that kind of believe in theory and ideals, even if you don't believe it to the fullest extent, to fill in the gaps and to identify where we can kind of move forward. I wanted to get a, even a little more specific about one of his particular claims. So he has a real, like a, uh, 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 
I don't know the right metaphor is. He's really pr finds advisory opinions to be particularly problematic. You have a whole section about advisory opinions, and you make this rhyme with his general skepticism of judicial of judicial authority. But it's not in any way obvious that advisory opinions would necessarily lead to a belief in greater judicial power. You could imagine a world in which you could announce everything's fine in advisory opinions, or rather that advisory opinions would be a way of binding yourself when to, if, if a judge has announced that a, a, a rule is constitutional or a court has announced that a rule is constitutional, they can't when the stakes randomly get higher because of later events. And so it's not obvious that uh, a particular attitude towards advisory opinions necessarily is the same as it, – it has other things that it matters. So it's a belief that, like, you need facts on the ground in order to decide – you need concrete cases to decide case. But, like, what's with the advisory opinions bit? So advisory opinions promulgated by courts for a contemplated action by a legislature or an executive action was one of the banes uh, of Thayer's – existence as a law professor. He thought that advisory opinions were ill-advised for the same reasons, I would argue, that he believed in a presumption of constitutionality for legislative acts. When a court issues an advisory opinion, you have an unelected branch of government putting their thumb on the scale of a piece of legislation that is being contemplated by the people's representatives. The paramount principle of democracy is self-rule, and that finds its highest expression through the people choosing legislators to pass the laws that govern their lives and liberties. And for an appointed bench to weigh in before a bill has been passed as to its constitutionality smacks of the same kind of anti-democratic uh, instinct that we see in the bench being overzealous in voiding legislative acts after they've been passed. And Felix Frankfurter is among the most iconic names in the history of the Supreme Court who draws this very lesson from Thayer. And Frankfurter believes that the uh, opposition to advisory opinions and a conviction that legislative acts deserve a presumption of constitutionality are of a piece. And he's very candid about crediting Thayer as the origin of his own view in this regard. Of course, most advisory opinions are actually offered by elected judges, which makes the thing much more complicated, but still, because they're done by state Supreme Courts. But we'll leave that aside. Um, so we, we, need to, we need to give some love to the students. I'm going to ask a little bit about uh, those whom you all cover, uh, and, and then we need to open it up to, to let the students here uh, have their chance to ask questions. I mean, it is amazing how influential he is and how beloved even, you know, many decades later, you know, something any professor would dream of achieving. I actually would go further and say, if you're interested in constitutional law doctrine, I mean, it's hard to think of anyone close to Thayer in his influence, even through the present. Just if we're interested in the structure of constitutional law even today, the, the basic premise that judges should defer absent kind of exceptional circumstances is Thayer's idea. And that's just, I mean, an, ex an incredible thing to determine even more than a century later what the um, structure of constitutional law is. But I do want to ask whether his students were a little heretical in certain ways. First, it doesn't seem like Thayer was an economic progressive. Uh, he, he probably wouldn't have been upset, as upset as some of his followers by Lochner three years after he died. And, and people like Frankfurter were, were primarily incensed by Lochnerism. And they appropriated Thayer's theory to that end. Second, it's really important to note that Thayer only thought the rule of clear mistake should apply to um, coordinate branches of government, which meant that f federal judges could overturn, could, could, would have to be careful about overturning federal law, uh, but would have no problem uh, with, uh, with overturning state law. And of course, that means Lochner 
is not something that is to which his theory is relevant. Um, Dobbs, not something to which his theory is relevant a, a, as he explicated it in the Harvard Law Review piece. So on these two fronts, I just wondered if you would comment, did his students, in a sense, betray him? Frankfurter is extremely concerned that the Supreme Court ad adopt a Thayerian attitude of deference, even with respect to state legislation, which Thayer said was not necessary. So maybe maybe I can take the second and you can take the first. Um, so I think on the on this question of, of kind of hereditiness, I, I do wonder maybe maybe his students were the people who actually completed the theory and actually took it to the farthest extent possible. Um, I, I don't think I don't think that his kind of view of federalism and his belief in federal courts being able to strike down state legislation with different standards than they might strike down federal legislation is the centerpiece of his theory. And I don't think that, I think it's difficult to explain using the values that he uses to explain the need for kind of democratic self-rule at the federal level to justify that theory at the state level and to justify federal courts striking down state legislation. Um, obviously there's, there's a lot of questions there to ask, but I, I think that it might actually be that his students are the true believers of the Thayerian ideals, even if there are particular aspects of Thayerism or particular questions that Thayer answered in a contrary way that might kind of be opposed to his own theories. So my, my humble submission is that they're, they're actually the true believers in, in some senses, but then in other senses, they kind of reject his teachings, right? So Holmes in the, the difference between Schenck and Abrams, um, it's a really interesting case study in whether or not he's he's kind of abandoning uh, theory and principles by kind of flip flopping on whether or not we should uphold the the anti espionage act. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there's a lot of kind of personal intervention that occurs between the two opinions to change his mind um, as to the validity of this legislation. And I think that that, if anything, and we we make this point at the end of the Holmes chapter, kind of proves our point more generally that students and, and justices and people in general are informed by their interpersonal relationships and that uh, people's decisions to change constitutional law writ large might actually just depend on like who they talk to every day and who they're engaged with and who they respect. I would just add that Thayer's ideas about judicial deference have origins early in his life. Professor Moyne mentioned that his famous 1893 article is predated by an 1884 article in The Nation. But what we found in our research is that when he was a law student at Harvard, he writes a paper that has the seed of this idea of judicial deference to legislatures. And I make this point because Thayer is starting to experiment with this notion of a presumption of constitutionality long before the era when you have industrialization reaching, reaching peak, peak uh, pace, and you have progressive legislatures in the early 20th century battling against more conservative judiciaries. The point being that Thayer is articulating these ideas as a matter of principle, and his theory of a presumption of constitutionality could apply as readily to left-wing legislation as to right-wing legislation. And so I take your point that he maybe would have had a different take than some of his acolytes about some of the Supreme Court decisions that are coming down in the early 20th century. I read Brandeis as being much more instrumentalist. I think he likes Thayerian deference when it's convenient. Thayer was really a person of principle who was willing to accept the outcome of the democratic process regardless of what that legislation looked like. And he believed that deferring to democratic majorities would result in bad legislation, but that it was up to the people acting through the ballot box to remedy those mistakes. And so Thayer perhaps had the luxury of staking out this really principled position because he wasn't actually litigating and he wasn't actually sitting on the bench. He could sit in his office at Harvard Law and enjoy all the principles that attend that kind of position. But if we are to judge him just on his writings alone, he is less concerned about pursuing any particular vision of what American policy should look like, and he's more concerned about letting democracy play out in whatever direction it might. 
So basically, as his contemporary H.L. Mencken said, um, a democracy is the belief that the common man knows what he wants and deserves to get it good and hard. <laughs> so, well, that's, I mean, I, I'm with you and I'm with there, but why would you believe that in light of our our experience lately that the popular majority can learn from its mistakes. Uh, it, it seems to just repeat them or worsen them a lot of the time. And that's why most liberals, especially in light of um, the history of American race, have opted for a different belief, which is that they should save the country from the people's mistakes, uh, elite rule. Um, but also, I want to ask, you know, do you, what, what else can we say about his relevance to us? I mean, you've implied that if we did take his democratic approach seriously, we would, we would drop his theory of judicial self-restraint and impose an institutional constraint on judges. Yeah, is that where you, you would take things, or is, is there more we can learn uh, from his career? So I think it's difficult to think about implementing Thayerism in the modern day only because I think in order to understand what the world might be like, you kind of have to go back to the legislation that the Supreme Court has overturned repeatedly, right? So like, what does Thayerism look like going forward? I would imagine it, it looks like a restoring of the Voting Rights Act, right? And a kind of return of certain political powers to the political field. And so it's difficult to imagine what that democratic world might look like if you restore the kind of democratic safeguards that the Supreme Court has removed over the years. And I think that might be one place to start when you're thinking about democracy in a Thayerian regime is the restoring of kind of popular legislation that judges have removed in order to restore the ability of, of particular populations to participate in the democratic process. Um, that's, that's at least somewhere that, that I would start. And I think you can imagine a different world where you have empowered kind of political majorities that actually represent the constituencies that they engage in. I think that it's difficult. I think it's difficult to implement Thayerism in the federal system we have, right, where you have a Senate that is wildly gerrymandered. There, at least in my mind, is no reason that Rhode Island should have the same representation as Texas, you know, and you can, you can make that analogy for a number of other states. So I think to fully recognize the kind of democratic ideal that Thayer is, is propagating, and I don't know whether or not he would say this. I, I haven't, I, I don't know if he ever commented on the structure of the Senate or, or on gerrymandering more generally. But I think there's inherent in his theory an idea that people should be able to enact their will. And I, and currently, at least at the federal level, it's not clear that political majorities, defined just by the number of people voting for a particular candidate or, candidate or a particular cause, can enact their, their vision. That's different at the state level. You can think of the, the Kansas abortion referendum um, as, as one example. But I do think that imagining Thayer's kind of Imagining a world where Thayer's ideas come into being requires us to re-understand how we think about democracy and how we envision the role of the courts in democracy, but also the role of our institutions in democracy. I mean, of course, Frankfurter famously did comment on gerrymandering in Kogler versus Green, but we can leave it aside. Anyway, so we're going to take it to the crowd.